Our great Father in heaven, we thank you for another day, and we thank you, dear Father, for your word, both in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, and we thank you for the promise of thy Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. And so, Father, as we consider uh, the subject of uh, your providence, your providential leading in the affairs of, of men, and in the affairs of thy church, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide into all truth, and that you would uh, open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We ask and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The uh, title of this presentation is The Providence of God. This is a subject that I've considered on and off as I have had a burden to help some people in this movement who are having a problem with um, the dates and the emphasis on chronology. What is providence? We have the, defini the definition of providence from the uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary. In theology, the care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures. He that acknowledges a creation and denies a providence involves himself in a palpable contradiction. Palpable meaning obvious. Uh, for the same power which caused a thing to exist is necessary to continue its existence. Some persons admit a general providence, but deny a particular providence, not considering that a general pro uh, providence consists of particulars. A belief in divine providence is a source of great consolation to good men. By divine providence is, is often understood God himself. And the reason I, I, why I, I have some of these words bolded and underlined is because you know, when it says some persons admit a general providence, you know, people admit, well, okay, the providence of God in a general way, but they deny a particular providence. In other words, they deny that God is deeply involved in the details of the affairs of our lives and the, and the affairs of, of the church, the affairs of nations. And so people end up really being, at the very least, similar to evolutionists. Evolutionists, of course, they deny a creator. They deny a, uh, a, that a superior, almighty being was involved in, in the creation of the universe, and they attribute all of the, uh, the details of creation from the details of our of our human bodies or are the details of everything from that to say how far the earth is from the sun and we know that if the earth was a little bit closer we would all burn up if it was a little bit further away from the sun we would all freeze to death god is particular about the details of his creation and also in his uh, his uh, involvement in the affairs of uh, this earth and I'll, I'll let you know where I'm going in all of this, part, at, le at least in part. When we consider a particular providence, I'm going to say that these are, in one sense of the word, miracles, the miracles of God. And also, as I am, as we're considering these things, I want us to consider all the things that are and others that we have taught in this message that are, that are on these charts, God is involved in these things in his providence. He uh, led in all of these dates. Okay, so the, ver the first statement we have is from Selected Messages, book 2, page 205. Who has authority to begin such a movement? We have our Bibles, we have our experience attested to by the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit. And as we, will, as we continue here, we'll also see that these are uh, providential interpositions. But let's go on to the next statement. God 
speaks to us, this is from Christian Education, page 56, God speaks to us through his providential workings and through the influence of his spirit upon the heart. And further on in that statement, she quotes from uh, the book of Psalms, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord, whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the, the loving kindness of the Lord. We need to observe and pay attention to God's providences. Then Review and Herald, under the heading, God's Providential Dealings, Review and Herald, November 27th, 1900, God, uh, the Lord wishes all to understand his providential dealings now, just now, in the time in which we live. Now, we need to pay attention to this because this is not just speaking in a general fashion, you know, when it says the Lord wishes all to understand his providential dealings, she says, now, just now in the time in which we live, but also his providential dealings as he has put dates and symbols of dates together. Then under the heading providential interpositions, the Lord has wrought for his servants and for the upbuilding of his cause at the present day as verily as he wrought in behalf of ancient Israel. But vain philosophy, science falsely so called, has sought to destroy faith in the direct interposition of providence. Notice, the direct interposition of providence, attributing all such manifestations to natural causes. So we need to ask our, ourselves a question. As we consider the dates and how you have July 27th, just for example, July 27th over and over and over and over and over and over again, all lining up, are we going to consider these things as just natural? Are we going to attribute them to the manifestations of natural causes? are accidents, or are they the result of the direct interposition of providence? I know there's people out there that ridicule such things. You know, at the very be just, I say the very beginning, I mean, I remember when I came to understand the uh, significance of John 666, for example, that's just, that's so elementary now to us. But I know people, especially the theologians and other educated people, that would ridicule the fact that we say, well, you know, when it says John 66, and then you have the verse that says, I mean, I mean that verse that actually says uh, that from that time forward, this is at John chapter 6, that, that they walked no more with him, and, and who walks no more with Christ at the end of the world? Those who have the number of the beast and the mark of the beast. So, John, therefore, John 666, and you have others. But let's, let's go on. He is asserting, he, okay, this is, it says, this is the sophistry of Satan to attribute these, these things, these dates and their, and their harmony to attribute them to just natural causes, she says, this is the sophistry of Satan. He is asserting his authority by mighty signs and wonders in the earth. Those who ignore or deny the special evidences of God's power are preparing the way for the arch deceiver to exalt himself before the people as superior to the God of Israel. Many accept the reasonings of these would-be wise men as truth, when in fact it undermines the very foundations which God has laid. Such teachers are the ones described by inspiration who must become fools, are we willing to become fools, in their own estimation, that they may be wise. God has chosen the foolish things, what would, what would be considered as foolish things of the world, to confound the wise. By those who are guided only by human wisdom, the simplicity, the simplicity 
of his mighty workings is called foolishness. They think themselves wiser than their creator, when in fact they are victims of finite ignorance and childish conceit. It is this that holds them in the darkness of unbelief, so that they do not discern the power of God and tremble before him. That's from Signs of the Times, January 19th, 1882. Also from Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 2, page 1011. I want to ask a question. I'm not going to answer it right now, but we have the answer at the end of this presentation. Are the chronological... What's the word? Uh, yeah, the chronological periods, are they part of the Word of God, is the question. All right, so the next statement from um, Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1099 and 1100. Pharaoh saw the mighty working of the Spirit of God. He saw the miracles, the miracles which the Lord performed by his servant, but he refused obedience to God's command. The rebellious king had proudly inquired, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? And as the judgments of God fell more and more heavily upon him, he persisted in stubborn resistance. By rejecting light from heaven, he became hard and unimpressible. The providence of God was revealing his power and these manifestations, these miracles, you might, you might as well say, unacknowledged were the means of hardening Pharaoh's heart against greater light. So this is a question for us. Are we going to allow our prejudices to cause us to reject these manifestations, we don't acknowledge them, and these are, end up being the means of hardening our heart against greater light. That's the question. Now, that's the test. Then from a review in Herald, October 13, 1904, during the loud cry, the church aided by the providential interpositions of her exalted Lord, will diffuse the knowledge of salvation so abundantly that light will be, will be communicated to every city and town. This is during the loud cry that these miracles, these providential interpositions, will diffuse the knowledge of salvation. The next one from Review and Herald, uh, February 21st, 1893, says, Will he who with his divine finger drew the boundaries of Judea, now, with his own divine fingers, he drew the boundaries of Judea, who designated the exact spot where the temple should stand, who wrought out designs for the Jewish church and for the service of the sanctuary, sanctuary, leave his people, his chosen people, who keep his commandments to a chance experience, to accident, to stumble along in darkness, shall those to whom he has committed most precious light, to whom he has entrusted the third angel's message, have less? of his providential leading than had his ancient people? The, the, the implication is no. And then Manuscript Releases, Volume 2, page 21. Those who, ha who have held the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end will be wide awake during the time of the third that the third angel's message is proclaimed with great power. During the loud cry, the church aided by providential interpositions by the providential interpositions of her exalted Lord, will diffuse the knowledge of salvation so abundantly that light 
shall be communicated to every city and town. This is almost a, a repeat of a previous statement. That was from Manuscript Releases, Volume 2, page 21. And then from Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 379 to 380. There is a study of history that is not to be condemned. Sacred history was one of the studies in the schools of the prophets. In the record of his dealings with the nations were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. So today, we are to consider the dealings of God with the nations of the earth. Now, you can equate the dealings of God with the footsteps of Jehovah. So as we look at here, you know, it's step by step by step by step. The footsteps of Jehovah, the, the dealings of God with the nations of the earth. We are to see in the history, in history, the fulfillment of prophecy to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. Notice from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 17. Angels behold the weary travelers, Joseph and Mary, making their way to the city of David to be taxed according to the decree of, of Caesar Augustus. Here in the providence of God, now we're, we're discussing here, I forgot to mention it, uh, prophecy and providence. So here in the providence of God, Joseph and Mary had been brought. For this was the prophecy, this was the place prophecy had predicted that Christ should be born. So providence and the fulfillment of prophecy work hand in hand. Also, volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 12 and 13. In his providence, the Lord has seen fit to teach and warn his people in various ways, by direct command, by the sacred writings, and by the spirit of prophecy. He has made known unto them his will. Then links in the chain of providence. We had, we, we've already mentioned the, footstep, uh, the footsteps of Jehovah, his uh, uh, dealings with men. Now we're talking about the links in the chain of providence. These things of God's creation have their foundation in, in the plans and methods of the deity. His thoughts and works are so connected with one another that we can read in nature the great love of God for a fallen world. The universe contains one great masterpiece of infinite wisdom in the innumerable diversities of his great works which in their matchless variety form a perfect whole. You know, when you look, when you look at all of this, you know, it looks confusing, but... You know, I, th I believe that angels and God, when they look at this, this is a masterpiece. This is a masterpiece of God's providence. You know, and I'm reminded, and I, we all know this, you know, uh, there are paintings that people do that have, how should I say, they're just, a bunch of confusion. You ever seen those? And they, people call that art. There, there, there isn't a, they're, they're not painting nature, they're not painting a building, they're not paint, painting a person. It's nothing but a bunch of confusion, but people call that art. <laughs> this is a masterpiece of God's providence. By close investigations, God's innumerable providences in the natural world are found to have connection one with another. And in tracing these links in the chain of providence, we are led to become better acquainted with the great center. That's from Youth Instructor, August 19th, 1897. Manuscript releases, volume 15, page 93, says, we, you are not where God... Now, this, this little snippet that I took out of the Spirit of Prophecy is actually a very small portion of a letter that Ellen White wrote to Uriah Smith. And she says to him, you are not where God would have had you, and you have missed the providential links 
one after another in the chain, so that now it is hard for you to see the mysterious connections in the endless chain of providence in his special work. And then um, another one from the, in the, uh, concerning links in the chain of truth from, from uh, manuscript releases, releases volume 20, page 378, 379. The great disappointment in 1844 was a trying ordeal. They had not the light that would have enabled them to discern the reason of their disappointment. Some gave up the faith. Others held to their past experience but became bewildered in regard to their position after 1844. They were exposed to temptation and received various errors as Bible truth. But I was shown that the Lord would, in his providence, clear away the rubbish of error and reveal to them the jewels of truth. These would be gladly received by many, and the harps that had been left tombless would be taken from the willows and again give forth sweet music. Many will discover the lost links in the chain of truth, his providence, and they will see a beautiful harmony in the whole. Now, the history of God's providences, Manuscript Releases, Volume 20, page 197. There, is, there in his open hand lay the book. Now, Ellen White here is speaking about, uh, I believe it's Revelation, uh, see, I, I think it's four or five. Five and six. This is whenever you have the, the, the book that, 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 that no one could read. Okay, Revelation 5. Yes. So, he, there in his open hand lay the book, the role of the history of God's providences, the prophetic history of nations and the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his laws, the whole symbolic counsel of the eternal, and the history of all ruling powers in the nations. In symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of earth's history to its close. And then from volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 753, I'm only going to read a portion of that, um, Drop to the second paragraph. But God's servants are not to trust to themselves in this great emergency. In the visions given to Isaiah, to Ezekiel, and to John, we see how closely heaven is connected with the events taking place upon the earth and how great is the care of God for those who are loyal to him. The world is not without a ruler, the program of coming events is in the hands of the Lord. Now, when we think of the program of coming events in the hands of the Lord, this is nothing different than God's providence. When God's providence leads, it's in his hands. The majesty of heaven has the destiny of nations as well as the concerns of his church in his own charge. Then the next statement from Education, page 177. While the nations rejected God's principles and in this rejection wrought their own ruin, it was still manifest that the divine overruling purpose was working through all their movements. And we are to see these things. I wish I had put uh, the book, uh, the uh, page uh, 190 in the book Education in this study, because in no uncertain words, Ellen White tells us that we are to see God's hands in uh, these movements. Anyway, going on to the next statement from Education, page 178. As the wheel-like complications were under the, the guidance of the hand, this is God's providence, beneath the wings of the cherubim, so the complicated play of human, human events is under divine control. Amidst the strife and tumults of nations, 
he that sitteth above the cherubim still guides the affairs of the earth. The history of nations that one after another have occupied their allotted time and place, unconsciously witnessing to the truth of which they themselves knew not the meaning speaks to us. When we consider the meanings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, when we consider their meanings, do you believe that uh, these people who named these cities, do you think that they understood? No, of course they didn't. They did not understand. Uh, I'm trying to find the words, how, how it reads here. Yeah, they, they, they didn't realize they were unconsciously witnessing. Still not finding it there. Second paragraph, yeah. Yeah, uh, anyway, I'm not, I'm not seeing it. But anyway, they were unconsciously witnessing to God's providence. They didn't realize they were being led by the Lord of all creation. Now, consider Amos 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. He will do nothing unless he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And also consider 2 Samuel 5.24, a little story here. It's amazing how many times recently my Bible has opened right up to that passage. 2 Samuel 5.24, uh, may as well read more than just verse 24. So we start in verse uh, 18. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Baal-perazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal-perazim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gezer. Now, it was last week as I was studying these things, I, I was getting, I'm going to confess, I was getting a little bit frustrated. As simple as this subject is, I was getting frustrated because I wasn't seeing things, at least in my estimation, as clearly as I wanted to see them. I wanted more. And so I was tempted to change the subject entirely and go and study something else. So I had made my decision I was going to do that. I was going to change what I was going to present. And so... I went to this, to this passage that I just read to you. And then I read some uh, references, spirit of prophecy references. I, I read, and I had the reference, but I had never actually written them down in my Bible. I have the two that, that you'll see here in just a moment. And so I read, I began to read them. Okay, I, let's read the first one from uh, Testimonies, Volume 5. 728, I was reading a spirit of prophecy statement 
in connection with the verses that I just read to you, and I'm intending to change the subject, mind you, all right? So she says, we are taught in God's word that this is the time above all others when, when we may look for light from heaven. It is now that we are to expect a refreshing from the presence of the Lord. We should watch for what? The movings of God's providence as the armies of Israel watched for the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, the appointed signal that God would work for them. So whenever I, whenever I read that, it's like I was, you know, I'm trying to get it get away from the subject of God's providence, and then right there, it's right there in the statement. So I thought, okay, all right. In God's providence, this happened to me, so I decided, okay, you want me to stick to this subject, that's what I'm going to do. So, um, praise the Lord. So uh, the next statement is from Re Review and Herald, June 11th, 1889. Are you ready to go forth as David went forth? He inquired of the Lord if he should battle with the Philistines. And the Lord told him that when he heard the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, he should go out to battle, for he would be with him to smite the host of the Philistines. So it should be with you. When you feel the Spirit of God, when you see the opening of his providence, see, he even had a in a sense, a doubling there, because she's mentioning it tw twice in both instances, you should go forth, for the power of God will be with you. May the Lord help you and me to, uh, so to bear the message that it shall be a savor of life unto life and not of death unto death. Now, I have there, between those two statements, a reference to Numbers 9, verses 15 to 23, and also Numbers 10, 1 to 10. Let's go to that just very briefly here, and I, I, I only want to make one point without reading very much of those passages. I may address these at a later time in connection with this subject of God's providences. But you'll notice there in Numbers 9, starting at verse 15, this is where we're told that Israel was guided by the cloud. When the, when the cloud uh, was above them, and stayed above them, they were to stop and set up camp. When the, when the cloud moved, they were to move. So I'm, I'm comparing that with God's providences. Same thing with the trumpets. The trumpets probably would be even more applicable to this, to the subject of God's providences. But they were given cert certain signals by the trumpets, and these were signals to either stop or move, or to go to war. So I'm saying that these are representative, at least in one way, of God's providences. Or to come to a sacred assembly. Or to come to a sacred assembly, yes. Okay, now, we also have God's providence. Even though the word providence is not in these passages, I'm saying that I'm calling this the pro God's providence in the life of Jesus. We, I keep trying to emphasize that God is very much involved in every detail of our lives and every detail of the nations. So, it says here from Desire of Ages, these passages are all from the book, The Desire of Ages. From Desire of Ages, page 208, it says, But the Son of God was surrendered to the Father's will and depended upon His power. So utterly was Christ emptied of self that he made no plans for himself. He accepted God's, God's plans for himself, and day by day the Father unfolded his plans. You think that day by day God is unfolding his plans for his people and for, the, for planet Earth? Amen. Amen. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will? Desire of Ages, page 368. The providence of God had placed Jesus where he was, and he depended on his heavenly Father for the means to relieve the necessity. She's speaking here about the feeding of the 5,000, and she says that God's providence had placed Jesus where he was. So in our day-to-day -day activities, does God place us, if we're submissive to his will, even in some cases... <laughs> 
even if we're not, even wicked men that are not submissive to his will, God's providence is still being worked out. And then this one here I love. I've, I've appreciated this statement for years. Desire of Ages 265. D this statement here, I believe, has far-reaching ramifications, far-reaching implications. Every act of Christ's ministry was far-reaching in its purpose. It comprehended more than appeared in the act itself. I don't care what event you may talk about in the history of this world, especially in his prophetic word, in Bible history, but even outside of Bible, Bible history, every act God is leading by his providence and every act of the affairs of this earth are, uh, is far-reaching in its purpose because God's providence is leading this next statement from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, or rather Prophets and Kings, page 499 to 500, is another one of my favorite statements. Very, very profound. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires appear, notice, appear as if dependent on the will and prowess of men. Okay? She's not speaking here simply about Bible history. She's in the annals of human history. This goes back all the way to the beginning. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires appear as if dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by his power by man's power, ambition, or caprice. But, in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and I believe that through prophecy, through these lines of dates, through these lines of chronology, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold above, behind, and through all the play and counterplay of human interest and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one, silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. I don't know of any, there's hardly any statement, statement in all the spirit of prophecy to me that is more profound than that statement. You, you have enough, we have enough light in that one passage to employ us for a long, long, long time. Now, the next passage, very long passage that I put in this study, is from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 180 to 182. I would encourage everyone, if you feel so moved, to... Um, read and really consider this passage because I, and I haven't plumbed the depths of this passage but it has far reaching uh, implications this is it says God had ruled the events clustering around the birth of Christ now in the line of the 144,000 at what point do we mark the birth of Christ? 1989. 1989. There was an appointed time for him to appear in the form of humanity. So, did God rule the events clustering around 9-11? Amen. Amen. There was an appointed time for him to appear, for Christ to appear in the form of humanity. Now, part of what... And, like I said, a lot of study could, be, could, could come from this passage. And I, it's, it's very tempting to go in a lot of detail in all of this. But we know in this movement, and we should know as Seventh-day Adventists, that God's purpose at the end of the world is to 
combine divinity with humanity. We're talking about the 144,000 in which the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced. I, there's an article, as a matter of fact, the one passage that I uh, read a few minutes ago about um, 2 Samuel chapter 5, and the, 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 when you hear a sound in the, uh, in the going, when you, when you hear a going in the sound of the, of the mulberry trees, that article is actually entitled something like uh, Man's Failure to Discern Divinity in Humanity, or something very close to that. You, if you look up the, the, uh, the date on one of those, I forget which one, yeah, I think it's the one uh, from, from, review, from review, and, review and Herald, uh, that's the one where the title is that. Anyway, so whenever it says there was an appointed time for him to appear in the form of humanity, this was a time of the beginning of the formation of the 144,000, is, is what I'm saying, in our time. A long line of inspired prophecy pointed to the coming of Christ to our world and minutely described the manner of his reception. And we are told minutely the reception of the third angel's message in our time. Had the Savior appeared at an earlier period in the world's history, the advantages gained to Christians would not have been so great as their faith would not have been developed and strengthened by dwelling upon the prophecies which stretched far into the future and recounted the events which were to transpire. Uh, let me kind of reword that, if I can. We just admitted that whenever it says God had ruled the events clustering around the birth of Christ, that this is, in our time, pointing us to 1989, all right? And so that's the time of the end, all right? So let's say this. Had Daniel 11.40 been fulfilled at an earlier period in the world's history, the advantages gained to Seventh-day Adventists would not have been so great as their faith would not have been developed and strengthened by dwelling upon the prophecies which stretched into the far future, at least far future from 1989, and recounted the events which were to transpire under the third angel's message. God has his timing. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's go on. Because of the wicked departure of the Jews from God, he had allowed them to come under the power of a heathen nation. So you could bring in Joel chapter 1 in here and all of those four insects that devour uh, Israel. And then it speaks later on in Joel chapter 1 about the king of the north coming, that uh, kingdom that was due to uh, oppress and... Uh, bring God's people, Seventh-day Adventists, into captivity by their teachings. So because of the wicked departure of the Jews, our Seventh-day Adventists, from God, he had allowed them to come under the power of a heathen nation. Under a, only a certain limited power was granted the Jews. Even the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin was not allowed to, to pronounce final judgment upon any important case which, in, which involved the infliction of capital, capital punishment. A people controlled as were the Jews by bigotry and superstition are most cruel and unrelenting. The wisdom of God was dis displayed in sending his son to the world at a time when the Roman power held sway. <coughs> Excuse me. And you could see in this the wisdom of God was displayed, displayed in sending his Holy Spirit at 9-11 at a time when the Roman power held sway. The Roman power in this would be comparable to the United States of America. Had the Jewish economy possessed full authority, we should not now have a history of the life and ministry of Christ among men. The jealous priests and rulers the leaders of Adventism would have quickly made away with so formidable a rival. He would, 
he would have been stoned to death on the false accusation of breaking the law of God. The Jews put no one to death by crucifixion. That was a Roman method of punishment. There would therefore have been no cross upon Calvary. Prophecy would not then have been fulfilled, for Christ was to be lifted up in the most public manner on the cross as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. The Roman power, notice this, the Roman power was the instrument in God's hand to prevent the light of the world from going out in darkness. The cross was lifted according to the plan of God in the sight of all nations, tongues, and people, calling their attention to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Let me see if I can find this statement here. Um, I, don't, I don't know where I have it in my notes right at the moment. Um, if not, I'll just reference it. I'll just tell you about it. Um, in the book, The Desire of Ages, and you can, you can if, if, you, if you just read the chapters that deal with the trial of Christ before his crucifixion, twice, twice, under different situations during his trial, I think this was his trial before Ananias, and the other one I think his trial before Herod. Whatever the case, whatever the situation, twice it happened that the Roman authorities had to interfere, they had to intervene is what I mean to say, because the Jews were so abusive of Christ physically that they would have, if the Roman authorities had not interposed, interfered, they would have killed him right there, okay? They would have torn him to pieces. But the Roman authorities interfered. So, let me read it again. It says, the Roman power was the instrument in God's hand to prevent the light of the world from going out in darkness. Now, this, is, this whole passage needs a lot of consideration because it's, it's a little bit hard to understand in some ways because in one way, it seems to be saying, and I believe it is true, that had the Roman power not intervened, then they would have killed Christ. But also, it's also saying, because you notice it says, the very next sentence, it says, the cross was lifted according to the plan of God in the sight of all nations, tongues, and people, calling their attention to the, attention to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The Romans coming on the stage of, the, of, of world history was according to God's timing. But also the Jews and their, either their lack of power or their strong power, it has its place. Because notice the very next paragraph. It says, had the coming of Christ been deferred many years, until the Jewish power had become still less, prophecy would have failed of its fulfillment. So if the Jewish power had been too little, then Christ wouldn't have been crucified. But if the Roman power, as you saw in the previous paragraph, if, it, if the Roman power, or rather the Jewish power would have been too strong, then they would have killed Christ before he got to the cross. So you have this, this restrainment and also, uh, what's the other opposite of restrainment? Uh, release. release. In those two paragraphs on that page, you have both the restrainment and the release. Restrainment of the Jews and, and release of the Jews. Restrainment of the Roman power and the release of the Roman power. They had to be at exactly the right time and under the, the, the perfect conditions. All right, let's go on. A lot more could be said about that, and I may address this at a later, at a later time. So it says, Had the coming of Christ been deferred many years later until the Jewish power had become still less, prophecy would have failed of its fulfillment, for it would, ha would not have been possible for the Jews 
with their waning power to have influenced the Roman authorities to sign the death warrant of Jesus upon the lying charges presented, and there would have been no cross of Christ erected upon Calvary. Soon after the Savior's execution, notice this, this is amazing. Soon after the Savior's execution, the method of death by crucifixion was abolished. The scenes which took place at the death of Jesus, the inhumane conduct of the people, the supernatural darkness which veiled the earth, the agony of nature displayed in the rending of the rocks and the flashing of the lightning struck them with such remorse and terror that the cross as an instrument of death soon fell into disuse. At the destruction of Jerusalem, when mob power again obtained control, crucifixion was again revived for a time, and many crosses stood upon Calvary. Now, I could give you the reference to that. I don't have time right now. I'm going to running t- uh, uh, short on time, but time is running out. But you can find that referenced in the great controversy, the first chapter, Sister White says there were so many crosses erected on Calvary, the very same place where Christ was crucified, there was, that there was hardly enough room to walk between the crosses. She mentions that in that first chapter, the destruction of Jerusalem. And she continues, Christ coming at the time and in the manner which he did was a direct and complete fulfillment of prophecy. She's actually summing up what she's previously told us in the preceding paragraphs. The evidence of this given to the world through the testimony of the apostles and that of their contemporaries is among the strongest proofs of the Christian faith. We were not eyewitnesses of the miracles of Jesus which which attest his divinity, but we have the statements of his disciples who were eyewitnesses of them, and we see by faith through their eyes and hear through their ears and our faith with theirs, uh, the, and our faith with theirs grasps the evidence given. All right, I'm going to skip the last paragraph and go on to another statement passage from James White. Now, this is something that I've had written in my Bible for years, and I just realized, I, I give you the reference there, and it's from uh, Bible Adventism, page 140 to 141, and he's taking it, James White is taking this from the Advent Herald, March 2nd, 1850. But you can find this, I discovered this morning, you can find this in the 1888 Great Controversy in the appendix, and you can also find it in volume four of the Spirit of Prophecy uh, in the appendix there. (coughs) So, James White says, the Bible gives the data for a complete system of chronology. Were the pioneers studying chronology? Yes. Extending from the creation to the birth of Cyrus. A clearly ascertained date. From this period downward, we have the undisputed canon of Ptolemy. We need to pay attention to the canon of Ptolemy and the undoubted era of Nabonazar, extending below our vulgar era, vulgar meaning common. As at the point where inspired chronology leaves us, this canon of undoubted accuracy commences, and thus the whole arch is spanned. And it is by the canon of Ptolemy that the great prophetical period of 70 weeks is fixed. Notice, It is by the canon of Ptolemy that the great prophetical period of 70 weeks is fixed. This canon places the 70th year of Artaxerxes in the year 457 B.C. So, let's quickly go here. I'm going to erase a little bit of this. This is going to be very, very simple, very quick, just to make one little point. God is very much involved in uh, chronology. So, it says the 70 weeks, 
Okay, this canon places the 70th year of Artaxerxes in the year 457 B.C. So, 457 B.C. is the seventh year of Artaxerxes. And you can find that. We might as well just go ahead and turn to it. So anyone here who might have a question about this, when you go to Ezra chapter... <clears throat> chapter 7 and verse 7. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and of the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And it is just before that, in chapter 6, where you have the, the uh, three decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. So this, is, this is in the same time, this is in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. And 457 dates from the seventh year of Artaxerxes. So James White continues. Actually, it's not really James White. He's quoting from one of the, one of the pioneers. It, it doesn't name the pioneer. And so it says, This canon places the seventh year of Artaxerxes in the year of four, B.C. 457, and the accuracy of the canon is demonstrated by the concurrent agreement of more than 20 eclipses. The, seven, the 70 weeks date from the going forth of a decree respecting the restoration of Jerusalem. There were no decrees between the 7th and 20th years of Artaxerxes. 490 years beginning with the 7th must commence in B.C. 457 and end in A.D. 34. So we know they end the 20, or rather the, 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 seven, the 70, 70th week ends in uh, 34 A.D. All right? There were no decrees between the 7th and 20th years of Artaxerxes. 490 years beginning with the 7th must commence in B.C. 457 and end in A.D. 34. Commencing in the 20th, they must commence in B.C. 444 and end in A.D. 47. As no event occurred in A.D. 47 to mark their termination, we cannot reckon from the 20th, so you... If you go from the 20th, he's saying, here, okay, let's say, here's the 20th, the 20th year of Artaxerxes, okay? He says, that won't work. The 20th year would be in 444, 444 B.C., That just won't work. And they would end in A.D. 47. So he continues. This date we cannot change. B.C. 457. We cannot change without first demonstrating the inaccuracy of Ptolemy's canon. To do this, it would be necessary to show that the large number of eclipses by which its accuracy has been repeatedly demonstrated have not been correctly computed, and such a result would unsettle every chronological date and leave the settlement of epochs and the adjustment of errors entirely at the mercy of every dreamer so that chronology would be of no more value than mere guesswork. As the 70 weeks must terminate in A.D. 34, unless the seventh of Artaxerxes is wrongly fixed, and as that cannot be changed without some evidence to that effect, we inquire, what evidence marked that termination? The time when the apostles turned to the Gentiles harmonizes with that date better than any other which has been named. 
and the crucifixion in A.D. 31, in the midst of the last week, is sustained by a mass of testimony which cannot be easily validated, I invalidated. So, you'd have to prove all those 20 eclipses were wrong. Can't be done. Okay. So I asked earlier on in this presentation, is the are the chronological periods a part of the Word of God? It was only yesterday, only yesterday that I remembered a statement. I've, I've had this Bible since 1986. And in the back of this Bible, I have a lot of pages, note pages, nice note pages with nice lines on them. And I've, since 1986, I, um, I've filled up all of those pages. But what do you suppose was the very first statement that I actually wrote on those note pages. Well, it's this very next statement at the end of this study that I had. And I was reminded of this yesterday, and I thought, wow, that truly settles it. But I'm going to have an extra paragraph put in there, which needs to be writ, uh, read in, uh, in context. This is Great Controversy, page 324. Ellen White is speaking of William Miller. When, therefore, he found in his study of the Bible various chronological periods that, according to his understanding of them, extended to the second coming of Christ, he could not but regard them as the times before appointed. Now, Ellen White here is endorsing William Miller's words here. So, this is... Ellen White was inspired of God. This is the word of the living God, and it is equating the times before appointed with the chronological periods, which God has revealed unto his servants. The secret things, says Moses, belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. And the Lord declares by the prophet Amos that he will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Deuteronomy 29, 29, and Amos 3, 7. The students of God's word may then confidently expect to find the most stupendous event to take place in human history clearly pointed out in the scriptures of truth. As I was fully convinced, says Miller, that all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable. What? All scripture. Even when it says the first day of the first month, the first day of the fifth month, does that include, is that included in all of that? In all scripture? And is it profitable? That it came not at any time by the will of man, the chronological, chronological periods, brothers and sisters, came not by the will of man, but was written as holy men were moved by the Holy Ghost. Yes, even in those things, these dates and details in the Word of God that we think, oh, that's not important. What did Paul say about our bodies, about even the human body? If the head should say to the foot, I don't need you, or to the little toe, I don't need you, that just won't work, will it? God has everything where he wants it for a purpose. And was written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Notice, I could but regard the chronological portions of the Bible as being as much a portion of the Word of God and as much entitled to our serious consideration as any other portion of the Scriptures. I therefore felt that, endeavoring, that in endeavoring to comprehend 
what God had in His mercy seen fit to reveal, to reveal to us, I had no right, I had no right to pass over the prophetic periods. Let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you that you have revealed to us the importance of your providence, even in designing these prophetic periods, all of their dates, we thought as human beings that these were just accidental, they were, that man was controlling them by his caprice, by his wisdom. But Father, we recognize in these your leading and your providence, your purposes being worked out. And so we pray, dear Heavenly Father, Father, that you would give us the willingness to study these things out, that we may give a reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear to those who ask us. Thank you for guiding us by your Holy Spirit, and we pray for your blessing, as we, uh, your continued blessing upon us for the rest of this day. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.